cultivate the desire to stay with the breath. Cultivate the desire to do it well. And don't be afraid of that desire. I don't know how many times I've heard people say, if you desire to do it well, you're setting yourself up for a disappointment, for stress, suffering. So just accept whatever comes. But the Buddha was upfront about the fact that, yes, there will be stress, there will be pain when you realize that you haven't reached the goal. But he says that's a desire to be cultivated. That's a pain to be cultivated. He calls it renunciate pain. He calls it pain not of the flesh. It's the pain that comes when you realize that you haven't reached the end of suffering. There's more to be done. Which is different from the pain of simply sitting around and being miserable. Because this pain actually motivates you to practice. The Buddha didn't tell you to develop that pain, that desire, and just to stay there. Just to act on the desire. Is you use that pain as motivation. There's work to be done, let's do it. There's something to be attained. We're not there yet, but we, if we practice hard enough and practice wisely enough, we can attain it. The Buddha's message is very hopeful, that we can, through human effort, reach an end of suffering. It will involve some suffering along the way. But the Buddha was always the sort of person who would think strategically. Some pains are useless as part of the path. Others are very useful. After all, we're going to be learning about suffering. We have to comprehend it. What better way to comprehend it than to cultivate a useful and skillful pain? Get to know it well. Use it. And then when it's served its purpose, then you can put it aside. Don't short-circuit the path by saying, well, the cause of suffering is desire. I just won't desire anything at all. I'll have zero expectations. That doesn't take you anywhere. It's like the Dharma teacher I once heard who said after many years of teaching, she didn't know if there really was a cessation of suffering, didn't really know if the Third Noble Truth was true. But she had her own truth. She called it the third and a half noble truth, which is that suffering is manageable. I'm surprised that she ranked it higher than the third truth. Contrast that with the John Swartz attitude. He told me there was one point in his practice where he realized that with the four noble truths, he knew the first, he knew the second, and he knew the fourth, but he didn't know the third. So I said about trying to figure out what is the cessation of suffering, because he worked on it, and he put a lot of effort into it. He finally came to know. It's when you set high goals for yourself and stick with them. That's when you really benefit from the practice. So even though there's a pain. That comes from realizing you're not there yet. There's more work to be done. That's a pain to be cultivated and acted on. The Buddha himself said the secret to his awakening was that he would not rest content with skillful qualities. What this means is that if the skillfulness in his mind had not reached the level where it put an end to suffering, he would keep working on it more and more. He wouldn't just stop. This is why he left his first two teachers. They taught him skills for concentration. He mastered them. 
and they realized that they didn't lead to the end of suffering. So he moved on, moved on. He tried six years of self-torment. That didn't work. He moved on. Kept looking for what would actually bring about good results. So he had very high expectations. And he stuck with them. He stuck with them skillfully. And he was finally able to reach, as he said, what he had never reached before, to attain what he hadn't attained before, to know what he hadn't known before. That's his message. There really is something special to be attained through human effort. During my first year with the John Fuang, he made the comment that there are some people who say the path is simply one of letting go, letting go. He said they forget. The path also includes development. And you look in the customs of the noble ones. The fourth custom is delight in abandoning and to delight in developing. In other words, you delight in abandoning unskillful qualities and delight in developing skillful qualities. You find your joy there. This theme goes all the way through the teaching, even down to the Buddha's teachings to his seven-year-old son. Whenever you wonder about a Dharma teaching, always go back to those instructions to Rahula to see whether it would fit in with what the Buddha taught Rahula. And there's no place where the Buddha taught him, taught him to have zero expectations. Or that it should simply let go. He said, when you're going to act, ask yourself, what are the consequences of this action going to be? And if you foresee any harm or affliction, you don't do it. If while you're doing the action, you see that you didn't think it was going to cause harm, but it actually is, you stop. You don't just say, well, I have to accept the fact that that harm is there. You stop. If you don't see any harm, you continue. When the action is done, you look at the long-term consequences. And if you see that you caused harm, again, you don't simply accept it. You resolve that you're not going to repeat that mistake, and you go over and talk over it with someone who knows better. Get some idea of how you might avoid that mistake the next time around. And if you realize that you didn't cause any harm, you should take joy in that fact that you're progressing in the training and keep with it. So there's a definite sense that you can improve by looking at your actions and looking at their consequences, learning from the consequences, and trying to make them better. Don't get caught in the trap of learned helplessness. A while back I gave a Dharma talk in which I mentioned there are some meditation methods that teach you that you really can't do anything. You simply have to accept things as they are. It was like an experiment they did with dogs one time. They put them in a room where wherever they lay down on the floor they were going to get electric shocks. And until the dogs, after trying to find a place where they could avoid the shocks and realizing there was no place, just kind of gave up. Then they moved the dogs to another room. And half the floor they'd get electric shocks, and the other half they wouldn't. And the researchers would drag them from one side to the other to show them which side was the safe side and which one was the side with the shocks. But the dogs made no effort to go to the safe side. Wherever they happened to be placed there, they just stayed right there. They'd given up. In their meditation methods, it would have you give up, say, well, there's nothing to be attained. Everything is in constant, stressful, not self. Just learn how to be okay with that and you'll be fine. But that's not the kind of equanimity the Buddha taught. His was the equanimity of a soldier. 
who has has to face setbacks and has to accept the setbacks, but doesn't stay with the setbacks. Keeps looking for a chance to come out victorious. The equanimity is there to make sure that he doesn't get discouraged. It's not there to make him give up. And then just the other day I received a letter from someone complaining about that Dharma talk. She had long quotes from a psychologist about how helplessness is a great condition. It's the human conditions, this psychologist was saying, that wherever you try to strive and find something in life, you realize that it's always going to be beyond you. There's always going to be disappointment. There's always going to be a letdown. And when you realize that you're helpless in the face of that, this person said, that's when you can find peace. Well, that's the piece of the third and a half noble truth. In other words, it's the piece of giving up. It's like the Buddha's image of the, the cow. You want to get milk out of the cow, and you're twisting the horn. And the harder you twist it, the more you irritate the cow. You're not getting the milk you want. Then you stop twisting the horn. Now some people stop there. Say it's much nicer not to be twisting the horn. You don't have to put in so much effort. The cow isn't irritated. But you still don't get the milk. You look around. There are other parts of the cow that you can pull on and twist on, and finally you find that there's one part where you get the milk. There is something to attain. You keep up your expectations. It's interesting how many of the Buddha's analogies and similes for the practice are about people searching. There's the man who's searching for heartwood, the man searching for milk, the man searching for oil. And they figure out how to find it, and they test it to make sure they've got what they really want. So this is why we cultivate the desire to stay here with the breath, the desire to stick with all the aspects of the practice, and the desire to do it well. Because those are the desires that will take us to a place we've never been before. So you've been taught, if you've been taught to have zero expectations, erase that teaching from your mind. Remember the Buddha's approach. Keep your expectations high. Don't let yourself get discouraged. Have patience, realizing that this may take a while. Have the equanimity of a soldier who faces setbacks. Have the equanimity of a doctor who, when dealing with a patient, may realize there are some things that cannot be cured. But the doctor doesn't let that stop him or her from treating the patient. You look for the areas that can be cured, the areas where, at the very least, the patient can be given some sense of comfort. So you learn hopefulness and learn to be mature about your hopes. And that way you'll be able to attain things you've never attained before, and you'll find that they really are worth attaining. <laughs>